okay? So I'm gonna be going back and forth between the individual as we change and how we change within the culture or a larger collective consciousness, okay? Because as gray nuns, you have a, a certain level of consciousness that you're oper operating in and as individuals and within the, in the country, within the church. So I want you to image spirals, because I think this helps, helps me. So whatever helps me is what I tell you. <laughs> Aren't you lucky? <laughs> now there's lots of ways to d picture a spiral. Sometimes people say, you know, it's spiral down. That's not my image. My image starts smaller, okay? And so it goes around. And you know, a spiral, in this case, I'm gonna just slow it down. So you have the spiral arm, okay? Now at some point, it shifts, doesn't it? Because unlike a, what do you call this, pendulum, you're not going back and forth exactly on that same trajectory. At a certain point, that arm goes up, transcends, goes around, so you're coming back around the same kind of things, but from a new trajectory. So you want to include what has been in your prior stage of development and start on this next cycle of the arm, of the spiral. I'm gonna suggest every time that we get to a chaos point of a collective consciousness, that's the time when the spiral arm needs to shift, go up and come around again. We don't always do well by trans including. Sometimes we forget things. So that's important, because when we talk about the shift that happens with Vatican II, it's a significant one, and I want to, that's where I'm really going with this. But that with these spirals, there's multiple spirals you live in. So very quickly, Nancy Sylvester. I grew up in Chicago. Any of you from Chicago? You're all too east, okay. Chicago is a very Catholic town. It certainly was in the 50s. So I was probably the poster child for a very pious Catholic little girl. I mean, anything Catholic I loved. I went to every one of our missions. Um, my mother said we lived in walking distance from the church. Truly, it was across the street. So I just could go to that wall, you know, and so I'd go and, and I'd go to everything. Uh, it was a time of missiles. Do you remember missiles? Yes. Mm -hmm. I saved my money. I bought the St. Andrew's missile. I bought the Marian missile, the Marino missile, the St. Joseph missile. <laughs> There was any new missile that came out at the mission, I would try to save it and I'd buy it. Because of course it was, everything was in Latin, you know, so you had this missile. Then I loved rosaries. Oh, heaven's sake, you know, so people brought me rosaries if they went to the Holy Land or to Italy. I had beautiful beaded rosaries. I had unbreakable rosaries, which I succeeded in breaking. I had glow-in-the-dark night rosaries. Rosaries galore, okay. I loved it. So now you can just picture being that kind of a child and here I'm growing up in the, in the 50s, early 60s in, in um, Catholic community, and I had two things, goals in my life. Huh? I wanted to uh, love God and be perfect. So what was my option? Join the convent. <laughs> because of course, we still thought we were better than you all lay ladies over there, you know? <laughs> and we had a higher calling. And we could be perfect, because God was perfect, unchanging. I could wear this blue habit the entire life. I couldn't wait. They had pockets. I loved pockets. <laughs> I'd always be with somebody. I never saw a sister alone. I mean, they always were walking together around the neighborhoods. I thought, this is pretty cool. I thought, well, teach, fine. I'll be a teacher. I don't care, you know? So <clears throat> I get ready to go in. 1966, I enter. The sister, one of the sisters, because <laughs> our, our community taught the grade school that I was at. <laughs> so we had sodality. She hands me this book. Actually, five of us entered, but so I hand this little fat book with a red cover. It said Documents of the Second Vatican Council. Oh. So I thought, hmm, well, I wonder if well, I need this, you know, tiny, tiny print. She said, Oh, I think you will. <laughs> so within, just uh, not even before we even got there, all of a sudden, we weren't going to wear the postulate uniform. Okay, that's not nice. I was, I was thinking I could, I could change my name. I don't know why I didn't like Nancy, but all of a sudden we found out we weren't gonna change our names. I mean, my life was falling apart and I wasn't there yet, so I entered. And what I'm trying to say, this is a spiral. So a spiral is how you grow up, right? And some of you have much more ethnic peace in your life. I was, my family came from, my, um, I'm Polish, but I was of the ear of my mother and father 
of course, knew Polish because they're parents, but we were not to learn that. You know, what were you? You were an American. You know, that was it. <laughs> so we lost some of that ethnic identity. But some of you didn't, and so you have, you have that spiral. Okay, so now you're coming. Now all of a sudden, I joined this group called IHM. They already, because of Margaret Brennan, who was our general superior at the time, had sent some of our sisters to start to get their licentiate degrees. They're getting the best in the new theology. We're in Monroe studying, because we had sister formation for the beginning part of our formation. So here we are, we're learning this stuff. Oh my heavens. So I had to make, at some point, that spiral that I joined, here, my spiral's pretty small on that little, all of a sudden I'm intersecting <coughs> with the IHM spiral. I could have chosen to go home and stayed in my spiral, or, but I didn't. And so I chose to make some changes in my life, which was not, were not easy, as I, I have this great, I, I wrote Margaret Brennan at that time, because she was superior, um, you know, that I thought I'd better go, I think I'm losing my faith because I, I'm sort of a head person. So I was learning process, philosophy, process, theology, blah, 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 I'm thinking, oh my God, and I had a God in me spirituality. Oh, this was really rather radical. So she writes back, she says, you know, and she was very empathetic, she said, but you know, sister, I don't think you should make this decision in February. <laughs> now in Michigan, you know, because it's a lousy weather. I was, I thought, she thinks it's just based on weather. <laughs> But I held out, <laughs> and 50 years later, I continue to be here. But the real point is I chose. It, there was a moment when you make a choice, and now all of a sudden that spiral changed me, okay? And I'm starting on a different spiral of consciousness. When you join the Grey Nuns, you enter into a new collective consciousness that continues. In fact, we have always lived in the country, well, most of us probably born and lived in the United States or Canada, and in both places, we were already into a very different consciousness rooted in modernity. I'm going to talk about that, because Don Beck says, cultures and tribes and societies shift when their material conditions shift. And that's why places that are, quote, developed, the Western world, is different than some of the areas which never had the kind of industrialization that I'm going to address in a minute. But do you see what I'm trying to say in terms of the spirals? There's multiple spirals in, in our life, and we can, we can change because of the collective, and we can change the collective. So I suspect some of you have shaped the gray nun consciousness as individuals during the time of your history because of what you spoke out on, if you're part of decision making, you can influence. Think of how Jesus influenced first century Palestine. Radically shifted that consciousness. Not yet totally living, but it, it, can, it can be an influence without it taking hold of the whole major, uh, the dominant kind of thinking. Do you, is, is that, are you following that pretty well just to have a sense of it? Because when, um, do that's not right, okay. So just remember that each today should transcend and, and include aspects of the prior one. Okay, so I'm gonna do this rather quickly. Um, it's about a couple of thousand years of, <laughs> of history. Uh, there's many people who talk, oh, what happened? Okay, there you go. There's many people who, who talk about stages of consciousness and they talk about them in different ways. I'm sort of pulling on the work of a man named James Marion just for these titles. But this is the earliest stage of conscious would be magical, mythical, then it goes to mythical, tribal, and traditional. And traditional is dominant at the Middle Ages. Everything, be, so it becomes, and that's in, important because our Catholic culture and our consciousness develops in this traditional consciousness. In fact, every major faith tradition has developed and pretty much remains at this level. What are some of the ca characteristics? Well, let me, some of that are more positive, perhaps, is how we build on that magical, mythical. <laughs> if you remember your history, do you remember how, this is time of pan pantheism, okay? Everything is infused with divinity for the earliest people. As we, but they couldn't figure out why did our crops grow sometimes and not other times. This incredible sun that gives us warmth. So what happens? Everything becomes capable of worship. And so you, you start to get a sun god, you get a moon goddess, you get goddess of the harvest, uh, the Greek great mythology, Demeter, Artemis, all the major players in the pantheon. 
And then we had to appease them, remember? So you, you did sacrifice, let the, so the crops would grow, or you would, then you'd give thanks. But it was a real in, intuition that we're connected to the universe. We're connected, uh, probably not universe at that point, but we're connected to all the things around us, sentient and non-sentient beings. There was also an emphasis on dreams and imagination and intuition. Knowing at that level, so think about even in our Old and New Testament, how many times does dreams come into play? And it's not like when I do my dream quote analysis, <laughs> the one that I use, you, know, you write out your whole dream, then you underline certain words, and then every word you do an association with until you get to the aha moment. I don't think that's how they dealt with dreams in the earlier times of our humanity, but rather they saw them as true messages, as true things that they were to act out of. Now I'm saying that because it didn't get included in some of the, as we move forward into modernity, some of that kind of an emphasis, but it was important. Now tribal, here, uh, some of the tribal sense is that I'm better, my tribe is better than yours, it's a time of great, uh, you had to su survive, right? So I either will convert Sheila, I'll shame Sheila, or if things get really worse, whoosh, we'll kill Sheila. <laughs> because she was a threat to the tribe, okay? Because there weren't a lot of rules yet, there weren't a lot of ways of operating, but it's a tribal, tribe above an individual. Obedience to the head of the tribe. Just hear some of that. Trigger how you grew up, what we know, obedience, external authority, okay? So then we get to the traditional, which picks up, you know, it's still some of the magical, mythical, and it certainly starts to structure in, <coughs> excuse me, a hierarchy. And I do mean hierarchy, because one of the best modes of governance that sort of embodies some of those values is a monarchy where it's top down, you keep the divine authority, but now works through humans, right? The divine right of kings. So even though it has now become a, mo a monotheism, it's no longer pantheism. However, God is still the top authority who gives authority over and it goes down the line. It's a time where we, are, are, I believe, our Catholic consciousness grows up. It's still sensitive to nature, so think of St. Francis. You know, when he introduced all the imagery around Christmas, because, you know, I don't think there are pine trees in the Middle East, but maybe. But you know, our imagery of, of the nativity, just think what he put in there. Do you remember, so here's Mary and Joseph, here are the humans, but who else was in that picture? Cows, yeah. Cows yeah. animals, yeah. angels, right. everybody. The whole known, you know, how we understood the world was there. So we still had a sensitivity. When I grew up, I still believed our animals had souls. So my sister and I would dutifully bury our pets who died in a shoebox. We would you know, bring our holy water out, sprinkle, give the right prayer, whatever blessing, and because we felt that they had souls. Okay? Now that was still when we were quite living in a, in a Catholic milieu, a Catholic consciousness. And that's terribly important because even into the 1950s and 60s, the church somewhat rejected where we're going in the next stage of consciousness. They wanted to keep us into, our, into the traditional consciousness. External authority, you obey the people from whom God has given the authority, i.e. pope, bishops. It was through ordination, like that gentleman in the uh, in the congregation that I spoke to earlier, that's where authority came from. But we had a sensitivity to connection to creation that wasn't totally lost yet, I don't think, within a Catholic consciousness. Now, just a parenthesis, you know, everything I'm saying is general, okay? There's exceptions to everything, but I want to give you sort of a little, sort of a breath because of what I'm going to try to, the point I eventually will make, I hope. Okay. <laughs> And so what happens? Around 1300, moving into 1500, some major developments happen that we know of as the scientific revolution, the age of enlightenment, and the age of reason. Now, do you remember those from history or philosophy or someplace? Okay. 
So picture this, up to this point, the traditional consciousness is peaking, okay? And remember, all the stages stay. The major authority was the religious leader. So be it a shaman, be it a rabbi, be it a priest, be it an imam. The great authority was in for those religions of the book came from scripture or came from the stained glass windows when we were all illiterate and the church taught our salvation history by the pictures on the windows. The queen of the sciences were theology and philosophy. Now think about that. Theology and philosophy, queen of sciences. Okay. All right, here starts come the scientific revolution. What starts to emerge, and nothing, nothing happens like overnight, right? But you start to see how it's, it's prior to that time, but now it's to seep into the, to what will become the dominant way of thinking, is what's real isn't what my priest tells me is real. It's what I can touch, smell, observe, test. It's a scientific method. And if any of you taught science, you might remember that when you were teaching it. All of a sudden, what starts to happen is the religious authority and leadership is sort of waning as the scientists amidst our starts to raise up. Now, as they do that, and, it, and these come into, <coughs> and they're about 100 or 200 years rolling into each other, with that comes then some of the advent of science and physics. Uh, Isaac Newton lives in this time. And there's great discoveries, discoveries that we, we couldn't be where we are now without his physics. And they discovered, or he, just, he said, the smallest part of reality is an atom. But they're isolated and disconnected from each other. Now I want to say that because what you're going to start to see is a, a worldview, a stage of consciousness that see things more separate than together, okay? And so, what happens is they start to look at everything as cause and effect. We don't connect with each other, we're all separate. Then you get someone like Rene Descartes, whom you might remember this line, I think, therefore I am. But what it really saw is as the God starts getting displaced a bit, not only in authority, but you also have God being displaced because Galileo and Copernicus before him made the discovery that the earth is not the center. It's not unchanging. It's not the way that we conceived of it and that which built our theology. Because people say cosmology shapes theology. So what happens now is we say the sun is the center. Now, of course, the church leaders do not believe this. They condemn Galileo as they condemn Copernicus. I believe Galileo was just forgiven under John Paul II. <laughs> so you know that's an awfully long time to come up to snuff. Okay. But the, the scientists who were deists were trying to figure out then, well, where, where has God in all this? So they start to think, well, maybe God is like a clockmaker. Starts it in motion and lets it go. Then who helps to fix it? The human. And why? Because the human species has the capacity to reason. And not the human species, but in particular the male of the human species. <laughs> <clears throat> the female gets relegated to the subjective realm. Emotions, intuition, all those things that at an earlier stage of consciousness were valuable, aren't so valuable. So then the men start to take a reason then becomes not only a good way of knowing, it becomes the only way of knowing. And so you start to really lose some of those other aspects of how we can come to know. And clearly God and faith really becomes relegated to almost not very important or to the private side of oneself. And so we get, and eventually gets worse because they start to talk about other beings as not at all sentient with souls but that only other material and all the resources and other species are for the use of man. And so you get then the ages of the exploitation, the conquest, the going into other countries. Those who had the capacity, material capacity, to start to do the kind of physics and do the industrialization that would emerge from this view point, from this stage of consciousness, ends up then con doing conquest. And so we start the exploitation of countries, the rape of the land, the rape of the women, the use of resources. And pretty soon, 
all of the other sentient and non-sentient beings are truly just there for our use and how what kind of utility they can be. So in that sense, and modernity is actually the capitalism, that's another word for the beginning of industrialization. So we have then the modern stage of consciousness starts to come out of the earlier than the Middle Ages, starts to peak, and really peaks probably is still peaking. I mean, in a sense, it's peaked, and most advanced industrialized countries live out of that stage of consciousness. Now, get a feel, though, for what is it doing to religious leaders. They don't like it because they're being displaced, correct? All that they held as what makes things real and how to know is saying that's not valuable any longer in the public square. So we have in our church, as of 1900, priests having to take an oath against modernity. And so we see that the church did not teach adults, how to, Catholics, how to enter that next stage of consciousness, transcend it and include, so to interpret in new ways, some of the gifts of the past. Really sort of cut it off. And I would say that probably even I grew up in the 50s and 60s, that people thought religion was Sunday and all the rest of their life, Monday through Saturday, had nothing to do with their faith. When I started teaching social justice, people looked at me like I was, like, why are you talking about this? Because it was never integrated. So I say, suggest, that the Second Vatican Council was actually an invitation to the institutional church to take the turn on the spiral and enter into some of the, the worldview of modernity and bring it around and try to include some of the values of the past. However, I do not believe most people did that. It is said that the best way to move from a traditional stage of consciousness to the next is to have those in authority tell you to do it. So guess who did it in, um, in ACEs, you know? Us. Because we were told by Rome to renew. Correct? Yeah. I don't think we would have, prob I mean, quite the same way. But we were, to and we were obedient. Everything a traditional consciousness is, we were obedient, we wanted to please, and so I believe we took the turn on the spiral. And for those of us who have remained with our sisters and brothers who left but who traveled the same way, we kept rooted, though, in our faith, even though probably there were times you didn't know what you believed. I would guess in this room, there had to be times when you were like in that dark night because stuff was coming and you weren't sure what was it, but you just kept going trusting. Because look at, and just this is from um, a, a book by, um, oh shoot, um, Anita Caspery. Do you remember Anita Caspery? She was the IHMs in LA, unrelated to us. 1968, Cardinal McIntyre tells them they're either to put on habits or they won't teach, they cannot teach in the schools. They were the largest teaching community in LA. They chose not to return. This is Corita Kent's community. So, I mean, yes. so they, were, they, they basically split. So they created a new kind of congregation that continues today, and then the canonical ones. But okay, so she wrote a book on renewal. Just, I think it's just very helpful to see what was happening. The orientation to scripture. Prior to this time, we didn't read scripture, right? right. You had that, in, you know, that in the middle part of your Bible, you had a Bible. But she recorded what? Deaths, births, marriages, that was it. <laughs> so we were asked to go to scripture. But again, never fundamentalist, never literal interpretation. The C Catholics took on some of the great Protestant work of